You're welcome. We're so thankful you're able to join us today, and we are grateful to God for the privilege we have to look into his word and to hear what he has to say to us again. We're going to be continuing our series on finding your place in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this privilege we have to learn of you, to learn the things that concern you, to hear your voice, my Father, to look into your word. Father, we bless you and we worship you. Father, we invite you into this time, O oh God, into all that we're going to do, all that we're going to share, O oh God, at this, at this moment or in, in this um, episode. We just pray that you will grant us light, you will grant us insight. We pray your presence, we pray your life, we pray your spirit will take absolute and total control. Above all things, Lord, let your will be done in the hearts of the hearers, of your people, of every person listening, O oh God. Let your purposes be accomplished in every life and let your purposes be accomplished in the earth. I receive grace, O oh God, to speak as an oracle of God. Lord, we say be exalted, be magnified in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So in the last episode, we um, talked about a few things. We, um, just by way of summary, we said that um, God could do whatever he wants to do on earth by himself because God does have certain purposes. We delineated the purposes. We talked about two. We said that um, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign. We also said that God is going to be restoring the earth. But we said that God has chosen to do all of that through a people. And we mentioned that those, we talked about the fact that the people um, that he will use is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. We established the core essentials for being a part of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we talked about and becoming born again, and we talked about uh, the absolute necessity of a change in lifestyle. So we um, said that all, all of that is because we're headed to the place where we're going to be looking into the, the work that God does in a willing vessel's life, in a believer's life, to fit us you know, for the work that he wants us to contribute to the body of Christ. Finding your place in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we said there's a work that God does to make us effective um, in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and in, we're, we're still on, in the process uh, of getting to that discussion. But today, what we want to do is just look at certain aspects of the functioning of the body of Christ. Uh, the operations of the body of Christ is massive, it's huge, you know, there's, there's so many dimensions to it. We just want to touch on certain things that will help set a context for us as we move into the discussion about finding our place in the body of Christ and yielding to God to fit us and make us effective to function in our place in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to start uh, by looking into Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6 in this episode. And in the next episode, we'll take verses 7 to uh, 16. Okay, so I'll read verses one, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So, you know, this Ephesians chapter 4 is a, it's a, it's a scripture that's typically read. In a lot of our fellowships, you know, we, we get to talk about this from time to time. And, you know, quite often we, we tend to go right down to the second part of this scripture or the middle part of this, of Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, when we talk about the different ministries and all of that. But before we get there, the earlier parts of this uh, chapter sets a very important context. And we're just going to spend some time working through that context because it is key for the second part of um, Ephesians chapter 4. So this is, Paul starts out by saying, he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. So we are called, as we said in the previous episode, we are called. We are chosen 
called, we are called, we are chosen, you know, to uh, show forth the praises of our God. You know, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are a, ro- a, a, a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. The Bible describes us with so many terms. So we have a calling. We are called and we are called to demonstrate. God wants to demonstrate things, many things about himself through us who are the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, but Paul says here, yes, you do have a calling, but you need to walk worthy of that calling. You know, so there's a lifestyle that befits that calling. You know, we talked about in the past, we talked about the fact that, you know, we've come into a new kingdom. We've come out of darkness where things were done a certain way. And we've come into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of our God. This kingdom has a master. And this kingdom, our master has guidelines and ways. There's a nature that characterizes persons who are in this kingdom. So we are told in this scripture that we need to walk worthy of that calling. We cannot walk anyhow. We cannot live anyhow. Within the body of Christ, we cannot function anyhow. We need to walk worthy of the calling with which we are called. And then it begins to break down some aspects of that calling that are really important to the the following discussions. So it says, um, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It is obvious that all of those attributes or, or, or uh, be behaviors or attitudes have to do with our one-to-one relation, relationship with each other in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is really critical. But before we go into talking about our one-to-one relationship, you know, it's important to establish that another relationship precedes our one-to-one relationship. Our relationship with God precedes our one-to-one relationship. Our one-to-one relationship is really important, and we're going to see how critical that is, but our our one-to-God relationship is even more important. There is an order. Our one-to-God relationship first, and then our one-to-one relationship. You know, if we gather as the people of God, and all that we are mindful of is our one-to-one relationship, we have really missed the mark. We have not done what God has called us together to do. So we're going to look at just one or two scriptures that speak to our one-to-God relationship. Uh, Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 5. Okay, we just want to establish that because this is the most important relationship. It is out of this one-to-God relationship that the one-to-one relationship flows. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 5 says, the Lord says there, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your strength. Okay, that's... um. That suffices. Yeah, four to five. So it talks about loving the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And you know, one might say, well, yeah, that was something that was said to the Old Testament church. But let's look at the New Testament because the Lord Jesus Christ brings this back and makes it a present reality, a present requirement for those who he called to follow him. So let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. So it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the Lord Jesus Christ makes it, he, he sums up all of the law and the prophets, and he says it comes into these two things, the most important things. And then he sets a hierarchy. That is really important. He sets the hierarchy. He says the first and the greatest, uh, the first and the great commandment is that we love the Lord our God with all of ourselves, everything that we are, all our hearts, all our soul, and all our mind. And then he said the second is similar. We love our neighbors as ourselves. 
it's important to emphasize because sometimes you know believers focus a lot on the in on the the human to human interaction you know even in gatherings coming together into in the place of fellowship and there's a lot of emphasis on the human to human interaction and even in ministry there's a lot of emphasis on the human aspects and not as much emphasis on the god on on the relationship between the brethren the believers or uh, the person who's ministering and god that is not god's order in god's order a relationship with him is priority and then after second priority, very important too, is our relationship with one another. So having established that, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4. So Paul, speaking about the functioning of the body of Christ, he says that um, we should walk worthy of this calling that we are called to. And he, he describes the ways, some of the character, the, the virtues we need to show uh, that will demonstrate that we're walking worthy of the calling. He says, with all lowliness. Okay gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. I want to look a bit closer into those words because they, they capture a lot. So when you look at the, um, the meaning of loneliness, not in the regular English dictionary, but in the Theia Greek dictionary, it says that loneliness means having a humble opinion of oneself. Humility, humbleness of mind, Humility of mind, humbleness of mind. So in our interaction with one another in the body of Christ, in our places of fellowship, we are called to interact having a humble opinion of ourselves. There is no, I am better than you. There is no, I am one up on you, you know, which is, which is a manner of life that typifies the world and the ways of the world and is so pervasive in our world today, vaunting self. In the kingdom of God, you know, in organizations, you know, in our world today, they talk about the culture, you know, of the organization, organizational culture. And when a person wants to work for a place, you know, there might be things like, do you, is this person a fit with the organizational culture? You know, the kingdom of God has a culture, has its own way of doing things. This is the modus operandi. So that in everything we do, we might be doing different things in, the, in God's kingdom, under God's hand. But the, the, the modus operandi, the way things are done, this is the, the culture within the way things are done with God's kingdom is that which the scripture describes. And is that which Paul speaks to in this scripture, you know, to, to uh, I mean, there are other scriptures that speak to it, but he speaks to it in the scripture. So lowliness, having a humble opinion of oneself as we relate to one another, preferring one another to ourselves not thinking too highly of ourselves, not thinking we are better than the other person, no matter what we see, they have or do not have, or what we have or do not have, okay? And so then he says, gentleness, okay? So gentleness, th that word, it means mildness, meekness. You know, that is manifested sometimes in the way we speak to each other, the way we act toward each other. You know, I hear reports of sometimes or stories about uh, in, in the church at large, you know, you hear how persons, certain persons in leadership speak to other persons and speak to them as if they're barely humans, you know, like just, you know, you order the person around and use very harsh words. That is not the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is not the way. That is not God's way. That is not scriptural. And even when we walk with God in our personal relationship, even when we do wrong, the Lord rebukes the way he does is, is he, he, with gentleness. Firm but gentle. Firm but gentle. So it says, this scripture says that in relating to one another, we need to be intentional about, about being gentle. It doesn't matter what part of the world we come from and what the culture of that part of the world is. The thing is that the culture of the kingdom calls for gentleness in the way that we relate to one another. You know, there might be times that a person's behavior even seems to elicit a lot of aggression. You know, might, might elicit aggression but for the grace of God. But the scriptures are there to guide us. You know, we, uh, we are to walk with one another in gentleness. And then it talks about long-suffering. You know, long-suffering means patience, endurance, and one that is really insightful is slowness in avenging wrong, which immediately suggests to you that they will be wrong. <laughs> we will wrong one another. You know, as we 
relate in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we come from diverse backgrounds, different upbringings, different parts of the world, different, even if we are from the same part of the world, even, but different upbringings, you know, different personalities and all whatnot. And as God brings us together to blend, we will step on each other's toes. We will wrong one another. And Paul realized that for the early church. And he said to them, you know, we should be long suffering. But that's the nature of God. God is described as long suffering. And God is long suffering. When we observe, you only need to read the scriptures. I mean, you need to even observe again how he operates with us. But we even just need to read the scriptures. You look at like the book of Kings and you look at the, the kings of Judah, you know, and uh, all the, you look at how they deviated from the Lord and the extent of wickedness that they went to. And sometimes you wonder, Lord, why didn't you judge them sooner? But God is long suffering. So one of the characters or virtues that we, we must develop by the help of God is long suffering, being slow to avenge wrong. And then it says, um, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So there is a bond that binds us as the people of God, as the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The whole, when we come into the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit unites us. There's a bond that he puts in the midst of us. He's there. The Holy Spirit puts that bond in the midst of us. But he says we need to be minded to preserve the unity of the Spirit. That unity that the Holy Spirit has created. We need to be mindful to preserve it. And how are we mindful to preserve it? By, or what are the ways we can do that? By bearing with one another in love. You know, when we talk about bearing, it, bearing for bearing means there's, there's something that, would, that is making you uncomfortable. There's something you may not quite like. There is something that may not quite fit the way you would like things to go, you know. So you, but you forbear. We bear with one another in love. We accommodate one another in love. And so how do we preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace? By bearing with one another in love. You know, by learning this virtue, these virtues like gentleness and lowliness that this scripture has um, spoken about. What, you know, one of the toughest things for human beings, if not the very toughest, is getting along with one another. If we look at our world today, there's a lot of strife. There's a lot of conflict. There are a lot of wars. At the very root of all of that is man, unregenerated man's, mankind's inability to relate to one another free of strife. It takes the nature of God to be able to relate to one, for people to be able to re relate to one another free of strife and contention. You know, you, any, in any setting, we define conflict in different ways, but if you, look, if you take it right down to the sm smallest group of people or microcosm of people, you put a small group of people that are almost homogeneous together, you still see a lot of conflict in the midst of that because it's a limitation of the um, fallen human nature. But, it, but, but the nature of God is different. The Lord Jesus said, Lord, make, Father, make them one as we are one. God is able to make his people one. God is able to craft a deep unity in the midst of his people. And indeed, that's what he has said he's going to do. You know, it's in the different parts of the scripture. And as we read, as we get further down into Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to see that's what God has said that he's going to do in the midst of us. He has the ability to do it. He will, but, 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 but as he works in us, we must embrace and mature in these virtues. We talk a lot about the work we have to do for the Lord, you know, the body of, as the body of Christ and all of that. Um, and those are very important. But this unity is a principal thing. Without this unity, we cannot mature into the one man that God wants his body to mature to. You know, sometimes we may seem to prioritize the works more than this element of love and unity in the body of Christ. But that's, that's not the right order. Love, unity, is a principal thing. It's a key part of what the Lord is doing in his people. Because God is maturing his body as one man. And without us learning these virtues, um, this, this culture, I'm just choosing to call it culture, this culture of the kingdom, this love culture and unity culture of the kingdom, without us learning it, we cannot mature into one man like the Lord wants us to grow into. 
So then we go to verse 4 here. Verse 4 says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. So again, this is a, a, a knowledge that we need to keep in mind. Because when we keep in mind the fact that there is one body, then we begin to realize that there is no room for schism. And there is no room for breakaways. And that there is no room for denominations. Because they don't fit into what the Lord is saying here. In the true church of our Lord Jesus Christ, there, is, there are no denominations. The Bible says there is one body. It's, it's, a, it's a renewing of the mind we need to have. Because when we have it, it will drive the way we address issues in the body of Christ. It will drive the way we behave. It will drive the way we approach situations. It will drive the way we approach conflicts in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it says there is one body. There is one body, one spirit, just as you're called in one hope of your calling. But then when we say there is one body, it's not one body anyhow, <laughs> so to speak. Um, the on, in reality, the only way it, we can operate as one body is if we operate under one master, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, not under the lordship of man, not under the dominion of man, under the dominion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the leading of the Holy Spirit, whom the Lord has given to us to to, to, to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, you know, in all the operations of the church. Let's look at, um, you know, the, sometimes people believe that, uh, well, you can say that, you can say the Lord Jesus is our master, but you know, in all these little, little things as we relate to one another, little issues that come up, we, um, yeah, we, we can sort these things out by ourselves. But that's not true. The Lord, the, 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 the Lord fills his church. The Bible says that the fullness of him filleth all in all. The Lord is present in all the aspects of his church. He's present in all the details of his church. The Lord Jesus is a, he's, he's a hands-on leader. He's a very present help. He's not, he has not given us the commission and gone off and sat somewhere. He's there because it is by him and by his virtues and by his life that the commission that he has given to his church or the all that he wants to accomplish through his church will be fulfilled. Let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Just quickly pick up a verse there about the Lord's presence in the midst of his body. So it says, verse 1 says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lamp stands. So we know that these are the letters the Lord wrote to the churches in the different cities, to the church in Ephesus, to the different churches, you know. And he talked about different things that were going on, the nitty-gritty that was going on, or nitty-gritties that were going on in the midst of those churches, you know. So he knew the details, he knew the issues, he understood what was going, everything that was going on, he knew. And he was administering them, and so he was speaking to them, bringing correction where co correction was necessary, and bringing encouragement and counsel as it was necessary. But he preceded that by introducing himself. He says he holds the seven stars in his right hand and he walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands or the seven golden candlesticks, as some translations say. The candlesticks or lampstands are the churches in the different cities. And he says he walks in the midst of it. So when you say someone, think about maybe walking in a garden. If you walk in the midst of a garden, you're not walking around the garden. You are walking in between. All the, if it's like a maze, you're walking everywhere. The Lord walks in the midst of the candlestick. He's, he's present in the midst of his people. He, he sets things in order. He helps us with our differences. He mediates, you know. He comes to grant us wisdom and guidance and, you know, tell us, you know, be calm. This is when to respond. This is how to respond to this situation. And so on, so on and so forth. He comes to administer in the midst of his, of his church. You know, and it is under that type of operation, when we allow him to be Lord in the midst of us and the Holy Spirit to direct our operations, that, we will, that truly the church can fulfill this, this vision or this calling of being one, one under Christ. Let's look at another scripture that kind of just gives some more perspective on this. Let's look at Numbers chapter 9, verses 16 verses 6 to 13 rather numbers chapter 9 because we know how that 
God brought the Israelites out of Egypt and he was taking them to a promised land. And I mean, he brought these people out as they had been slaves and they had this, a slave mentality. They had been slaves for a long time. They had a lot of issues, you know, they had been slaves for a long time. And God brought them out and he had to form them into a nation, literally. He gave them laws. He had to teach them everything in terms of his own way of doing things, in terms of his own um, culture. So let's look at Numbers chapter 9, verses 6 to 13. Numbers chapter 9, verses 6 to 13. Okay. It says, Now there were certain men who were defiled by a human corpse, so they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron that day, and those men said to him, We became defiled by a human corpse. Why are we kept from presenting the offering of the Lord at this appointed time among the children of Israel? And Moses said to them, Stand still, that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If any one of you or your posterity is unclean because of a corpse or is far away on a journey, he may still keep the Lord's Passover. On the fourteenth day of the second month, at twilight, they may keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break one of its bones. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. Okay, we'll stop that there. So the, so the situation these people had was one where there was no clear-cut solution. God had given the laws about the uh, Passover, but there was no clear direction on what to do in that case if a person had been uh, you know, defiled by exposure to a corpse. You know, and so he was unclean. They were unclean, so they couldn't partake, partake, partake of the Passover. So they went to Moses. Moses did not just create a law. He went to the Lord, and the Lord gave him wisdom on what to do. Normally, the Passover was the 14th day of the first month. The Lord said they can have it, take, have the Passover 14th day of the second month. So the Lord gave the guidance that was necessary. I brought us there to see the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is hands-on in the midst of the candlesticks, in the midst of his church. And when we yield to him as um, our head and follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you know, we are able to fulfill that which he says that the church, there is one body. As we embrace the attributes that he calls us to embrace under his leadership and his lordship, we're, we're able to accomplish that which is his mind, that there'll be one body. We will walk worthy of our calling. We have one body and we walk worthy of the calling that we are called to um, in Christ Jesus Christ. And we go on to accomplish that which is his, in his mind for the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's all the time that we have today. In the next episode, we will um, continue to develop this thought and then move on to talking about the operation of ministries in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you richly, guide you, and cause these words to accomplish all of his will in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>